What is going on, Clippers fans? Welcome to episode 130 of Clips and Dip. We are part of the 213 Hoops Empire. I am Chuck Mockler. I'm joined by Adam Oslin. We are usually joined as well by William Updike, but he is unavoidably detained as he is enjoying, I believe, wine country this weekend to try and de-stress as the Clippers end their season on a back-to-back. Um, yeah, today... We're talking Friday night games to watch for the Clippers because the seating is still very tight. We don't really know what's going to happen. We're also going to preview the whatever is going to happen back-to-back weekend for the Clippers. <laughs> AM 570's own Adam Oslin is here. Adam, how are you feeling as we head into this very <laughs> unpredictable kind of Clippers weekend? Well, certainly better after what happened uh, the other night against the Lakers where the Clippers stepped up and won a must-win game. And it basically was a must-win to stay out of the play-in tournament. And they're in a great spot now to not have to do what they did last season, which, in effect, they failed at getting out of it. In fact, I think I saw this from Jamal Christopher of the 213 Empire. The last two, the only two, I guess, because we've only had the play-in tournament a couple of years now, uh, teams that finished in eighth in the West – Never made it out of the play-in tournament. The oh, Clippers wow. last season, and then Golden State the year before that, who lost to the Lakers and then lost in double elimination to the Memphis Grizzlies after that. So you can't take your chances of ending up in the play-in <laughs> tournament. You can't. And I was proud of the performance the Clippers showed once again against the Lakers, winning 11 straight over them. Do you know what the Lakers' largest lead has been over those 11 games against the Clippers that they've won 11 straight over the Lakers is? Is it like eight? Six. What? Wow. The most the Lakers have ever <laughs> led by in all 11 of those games is six points. Wow. For just domination by the Clippers. Which game? Was it the one where Reggie did the skips so and then they ended up winning? Ooh, possibly. It could have been skip to my Reggie Lou. <laughs> Man, that's uh, it could have been that one. But there, there have been some close ones, but the Lakers have never had – you know, a substantial lead, a lead, a double digit lead against the Clippers. Hey, I know great teams. It's hard to beat, you know? Um, <laughs> all right. So we're talking some Friday night games to watch. We're recording this at like 1230 on Friday afternoon. Robert Flom of the 213 uh, Empire wrote a great simple piece <laughs> to help people figure out what to root for. Cause I don't <laughs> know about you, Adam, but I've been reading a bunch of tweets and stuff. There's all these combinations of what can happen. And, but Flom broke it down well. So the Warriors and Kings play tonight. The Warriors lose. That would help solidify the Clippers to hold the fifth seed. Uh, there are some reasons we want to maybe avoid that seed, which we're going to talk about later. Um, but it also seems like the Kings are going to arrest everybody. So the Warriors are probably going to win that one regardless. Pels versus Knicks. A Pels loss would make the Clippers finishing ahead of them pretty much 100%. The Knicks might rest people because they're locked into the fifth seed for their conference. Who really knows? Suns versus Lakers. Suns winning would fully lock them into the four seed. Not that they're, you know, really at risk of losing it now. Um, But if they fully lock into the four seed, that means they have nothing to play for against the Clippers on the final game of the season this Sunday. Um, A Lakers loss would also mean they couldn't pass the Clips in the standings, locking the Clippers into a top seven seed. So the recap. If the Lakers and Pels lose and the Warriors win, the Clippers should be set for the fifth or sixth seed, and we can kind of pick our opponent. If all those teams win, we really need to win (laughs) both games in the back-to-back against a really bad Blazers team and a not really sure we're going to see on Sunday Suns team. We can still technically end up anywhere from the fifth to the ninth seed, But that doesn't seem very likely, right? Like, it it feels like it's probably going to be five or six. I hope we're not nine. (laughs) Some of that would involve the Clippers losing both games over the weekend. I don't see that happening. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, No matter who they play against the Blazers, there's really no excuses for that one. They have to find a way to win. And there was already that warning shot out there because the Minnesota Timberwolves took the Blazers lightly the other night in Minnesota. And lost to them. And that was a huge loss for the Timberwolves. They couldn't afford to have that happen. It looks like they're going to end up likely in 9 or 10 now. 
Yeah, it's all kind of a mess, which I guess is good that it's not just the Clippers <laughs> who are going to be a mess. Um, that game on Sunday, which we're going to talk about, Law Murray had some interesting thoughts on Twitter. He pointed out it's the Suns' home finale. They have a day off before the Clippers come in. Um, the day after there, you know, it's the second game of a back-to-back for the Clippers. And they haven't had very much time together as a full-strength unit. So... We're going to talk about that next game in the next segment, but I think Sunday we're going to see some pretty high-level play, almost playoff s basketball, at least for parts of it. Because I kind of agree with Law. I think the Suns are going to play kind of their full squad. They're sitting everybody tonight. They have a day off on Saturday. Like It feels like we're going to see the full Phoenix. It could come down to whether or not they want to see the Clippers in that first right. round matchup, totally. you know, the game tonight, the one to watch is the Pelicans and Knicks because of the Knicks somehow win that game and the Pelicans are favored by nine. Everyone's expecting Damn. them to Ooh. show up because they need it more. <laughs> and the Knicks are locked into a four or five matchup against the Cleveland Cavaliers where I expect them to get swept or taken sure. out in five games. I will agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> so they probably should rest up for that quick exit. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that game tonight, if the Pelicans lose, the chaos could ensue because then <laughs> the Clippers win tomorrow and they could have a chance to pick on Sunday against Phoenix whether or not they want to play the Suns or whether or not they want to play the Sacramento Kings, assuming the Golden State Warriors beat the Kings tonight and then they have the Blazers on Sunday. Which they probably should. Like the They should probably beat the Kings given the rest and you know everything like that. Um so we asked on Twitter kind of who do we want, the Suns or the Kings? There's a great piece uh, by the Suns writer Gerald Bergay. Um, he had the Clippers listed on his preferred playoff opponent for the Suns due to the lack of Paul George. His logic there being that even if Kawhi outplays Durant, they still have Devin Booker at DeAndre Ayton, which kind of tip the like best player scales in their favor. Russ's unpredictability. Um, he has been shooting great. Some people uh, are maybe worried that it might resort back to what it usually is um, and kind of, you know, he would be a constant target on defense um, for the Suns, which I think also nothing really surprising there. Um, the Kings. Oh, go ahead. That game against the Lakers, we talked about it or at least tweeted about it. And I talked about it with Will post game on the double dip, but that was a huge game from a Coach Lou standpoint, and maybe yeah. tipping his hand to stuff he could do and you could see coming up in a playoff series where Russ only played the first five minutes of the third quarter and didn't hot get hand. back into the ball game. Yeah, they rode the hot hand with Bones Highland out there, with Norman Powell playing as well as he did. By the way, I had Norm as my – Perform, uh, performer of the night or surprise performer I think of the night. He did. Yeah. Will, though, had Bones <laughs> Highland, which was a great call. All 14 of his points in the fourth quarter. Did you have Big Zoo? I not have Zoo. I forgot to put the poll up on Twitter. Let me check who <laughs> I put up. <laughs> but I forgot to put it on there. And I felt I was just thinking, like, we dominated um, in that surprise performer of I the night Terrence. category. I picked That's good, too. Hey, he wasn't bad. He wasn't bad. Yeah. So he we guarded did, LeBron a, a lot. Sweep. Yeah, that was a clean sweep. Um, I think you're right, though. Ty, that was my favorite Ty game of the season because Russ played great. Then he brought Russ back in, and Russ rightfully kind of got benched in the third quarter. <laughs> Things were kind of getting away from him. And then he just rode the hot hand. Like, that's going to be the playoff rotation. Um, but there's also this Marcus Morris question, which we're going to discuss um, in the next segment. And so looking at the Kings – they seem like a difficult first-round opponent due to their pace. Obviously, that home court advantage is going to be absolutely insane. Um, they play at the 11th fastest pace of the NBA, while the Clips play at the 21st, which is actually a little lower for the Kings than I thought it would be. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. And, and the Clippers really, they have been 14th, though, in pace since the trade deadline, so since right. bringing in Russell Westbrook. So That's they're call. not as far away, and Sacramento has still been at 11 post-trade deadline. So they're a little bit closer in style of play. To me, it's it's a more of a contrast in style of play when you're taking on the Kings versus just much more high-end talent if you're taking on the Phoenix Suns, who may yeah. play at a tempo that the Clippers would prefer. 
Yeah, um, we asked Clipper fans over on Twitter at Clippers Pod if you're not following us. Uh, would you rather Clippers play the Suns or the Kings in the first round of the playoffs? Seventy three percent of the people who voted picked the Kings, um, which I thought was interesting. I didn't think it would be that clean of a sweep, but I'm assuming you voted for the Kings if you did your uh, American duty and voted in this Clips and Dip poll. I voted for Sacramento. We've talked about it for a month on here on Clippers Talk. The path of least resistance matters. I do believe you can lose a championship in the regular season just based upon your seeding, your bracket. And I go back to that Clippers series against the San Antonio Spurs back in 2015. I think that first round, aside from just the fact that Chris Paul ended up getting hurt in that game seven before hitting the game winner over Tim Duncan, even aside from that, I think a lot of guys were worn out and that contributed to their collapse against the Pretty Houston sure. Rockets up oh. 3-1 in the second round because they had to go against the defending champs. And that came together at the very end of the season where all of a sudden – was that the 3-6 matchup where they I caught San Antonio? And, so. and they were not the favorites. The Spurs ended up being the favorites in that series even though the Clippers were the higher seed. And everybody to a man said, oh – the, the Clippers are getting bounced in the first round. They won, <laughs> but it took everything yeah, out of them. It literally. felt more like a Western <laughs> Conference Finals type of matchup talent-wise. And that same thing could happen against the Phoenix Suns, which is concerning to me. Even if you beat them, not only do you have the Denver Nuggets in the second round likely waiting for you, but you could have a beat-up, worn-out Clippers team from Seven a knockdown, drag-out fight series. against the Phoenix Suns. Yeah which yeah. likely would go six or seven. Yeah, and, and we got some good comments on this too. Uh, Step Back Tree mentioned, he said, if they get past the Suns, we'll be rewarded with Denver. And we all maybe know how that series ends. I don't know for sure, but... Um, and then Sports Guy 808 said that he would rather play the Suns. Uh, they've played less than 10 games together this season, and there's not as much young pop um, as, as the Kings have. And then your favorite Twitter user, Yeti Moose, uh, said that he thinks we match up with the pace of the Suns better than the Kings. Um, he said he thinks the narrative surrounding the Kings being new is a bad one for a first round matchup. And that said, KD and Booker aren't used to each other. Age has caught up to CP3. We're good at their pace and we've beat them. I don't really know if I agree with that last part because we haven't. I mean, we'll find out on Sunday if we can beat this full strength Suns team, probably. But I think I'm with the majority on this one, too. Um, I, I think I want to see the Kings. I just get a little worried, though. You know, if we want to play the Kings and the Clippers try and throw a game to see how, you know, whatever, we can't really be that mad at that point, right? Like, because if we're like, oh, we should angle for the Kings, we're arguing for the Clippers to pick their spot, <laughs> which some people don't like. But in this case... I think the difference between these two teams is big enough to where it would behoove the Clippers to do that. To me, it's less about the lack of experience from Sacramento for wanting the Kings and more about them having holes defensively that are not going to be able to be shored up or shored up anytime soon because this is who right. they've been all season long. They basically, yeah. basically been a bottom five defense. So the choice there is, Yes, you may have to run a little bit. They may try to wear you out in that way. But if the Clippers are going with some of the lineups we saw the other night against the Lakers, where Bones Highlands get more run, Terrence Mann, Norman Powell had his best game since coming and back. with Batum is the key part. Yeah, with Batum and Avita Zubas now starting, yep. it looks like, second quarters to help out the defense when Kawhi Leonard's not out there, which was another great move. Also, Kawhi playing the entire second half, first time he's done that since 2013 in Game 7 against uh, the Miami Heat in the finals with the Spurs. But I just like the fact that there is – a clear-cut deficiency on one end for the Sacramento Kings. As good as they are offensively, they're going to give up points to the Clippers, and they really have nobody to guard Kawhi Leonard. He would feast in that series. Agreed. The Clippers are more capable, even though they haven't been great themselves defensively all season long, as I always point out. Since November 1st, they're 19th defensively. They're basically bottom 10. They're capable. 
in that game against the Lakers, even with the Lakers shooting very well overall, they made them work for it. Like yeah. those shots were contested. The Clippers yeah, have the personnel to flip a switch, I think, defensively and make life tougher on Sacramento offensively than the Kings can make life tough or you know on the Clippers offensively. There's a better chance the Clippers slow down the Kings than the Kings slow down the Clippers is what I'm trying to say. Okay, yeah, I like that. I like that train of thought for sure. Um, yeah, and the Suns, it's just like, I know it's only been, you know, nine games or whatever, but it's not like they added, you know, like a utility guy, right? They added someone who can win a game by himself. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter who else is out there. But and he's out there with DeAndre Ayton and Devin Booker, so. He makes Devin Booker so much more dangerous to me. Yeah, because he makes you him have the number two, which is incredible. A, Another mid-range assassin out there, and those are the shots that win you playoff games. Kawhi Leonard has openly talked about it before. One of the reasons that he likes to feature so much of his game in the mid-range is because they give up those shots with the analytics now. They're trying to stop layups. They're trying to stop three-pointers. The mid-range is open. Teams aren't used to guarding it. There are no Rip Hamiltons out there coming off of screens very much. So you can get to your spots, and even when there's defense there, if you have a refined mid-range game, it just doesn't matter if they have a hand in your face. We see it all the time with Kawhi just being a master of the mid-range. Well, they got two of those guys in Booker and Kevin Durant, and if you don't have Paul George going, who's also very good in the mid-range, that's a problem to compete with. I do think, though, there are some things that Phoenix has that the Clippers could exploit that, you know, there are some benefits to playing a Suns team, especially early on before they get it together. I know they're undefeated so far with Kevin Durant, but they haven't played great teams uh, with him as a Phoenix Suns in right. those wins either yet. They really haven't been tested. And last night, they were taking on a Denver team with nobody, and DeAndre Jordan almost <laughs> beat them at yeah. 35 years of age. Yeah, like, They watching... haven't looked that impressive yet. That's fair. And, like, I mean, the, the Clippers' depth is – obviously better than the Suns right now. So something about as well. Um, one last note kind of on that Pelicans Knicks game, Lucas Holland was just tweeting some stuff out. Basically, if the Pelicans win tonight, the Clippers could still end up sixth in a four way tie at 39 losses by accident. If the Suns beat them on Sunday, but we Clippers won't be in a position to safely decide that they don't need to try and win that last game. So, the Pels win. The Clippers very much need to win um, these next two games. Well, and the NBA has lined it up that all those games are starting at the same time on Sunday. The I Pelicans know. Minnesota game, a the nightmare. Golden State Portland game, <laughs> the Clippers Phoenix game. They're not trying to see any shenanigans out there of teams, you know, obviously tanking to try to lose to find a better matchup. They're doing everything they can scheduling wise, at least, to stop that. But. Yeah. You know, if if the possibility opens up, it's really going to come down to tonight. It really could with the Pelicans and that Knicks uh, game. If the Knicks for somehow win, then everything's really on the table. <laughs> it's all yeah. the Warriors beat the Kings too. Yeah, I think, and I think they should. Right. Um, the thing that gets me about this back to back, and we're going to go into the preview in a sec, is it's a home away back to back, which I hate. <laughs> it's at yeah. Staples. Uh, tomorrow and then in Phoenix on Easter, which is just like a little annoying, but you know, I, I don't know how much more annoying a back to back to end the season could be, but they figured out a way to do it. Um, we don't want to turn into the Lakers here and start making a ton of excuses <laughs> about scheduling when you have the most, yeah, you're getting a little spicy on Twitter. <laughs> after that, exactly. Like I was just looking for sound to do my NBA report. So I'm going through the Lakers post game from the Clippers game the other night, just going through one by one, listening to Darvin Ham, listening to Austin Reeves, AD, and LeBron James. And there's just this running thread of we had to play overtime last night, these talking points that all of them were hitting. So I thought I'd put the mix together and put it out there <laughs> on Twitter <laughs> at follow Adam A for everyone to see because the Lakers, they were full of excuses in that game. And I had some people come at me and say, well, you, you've never talked about the the tough schedule for the Clippers before? Yes, I have. I believe scheduling it's can a real lose tough schedule. Games. It is. Yeah, the difference is if you're the team with the fewest back-to-backs in the NBA, like the Lakers, <laughs> you probably should sit this one out when it comes to <laughs> talking about scheduling losses. 
Yes, I think that's I, – I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, all right, coming up, we're going to be previewing – Two very different games that the Clippers have to play on Saturday and Sunday afternoon. We got some ads coming up. Ads have been a little loud, so uh, if that's been the case, you go ahead and turn it down. We can back to back coming up right after these ads in three, two, one. Welcome back in Clips and Dip, episode one thirty. We're really putting them up there, stacking them oh, up. Yeah. Put the numbers. <laughs> if you want to get to us on Twitter, we're at Clippers Pod. He's at. Is that Charles Mockler, right? It's not Chuck Mockler on Twitter. But when I I lose my blue check because I refuse to pay for Twitter, I will probably change it to at Chuck (laughs) Mockler. Okay. (laughs) I'm at follow Adam A. Uh, Clippers podcast is where you can find the YouTube feed of this so you can watch us and see our cool backgrounds. I got the Ninja Turtles (laughs) Manhattan Project, the third game on the NES poster behind me. Chuck, what do you got there? Ranger Naturalist? What are you, a fucking park ranger now? <laughs> yeah, that's a Yellowstone poster. And then we got the uh, National Wildlife Preserve. I'm from Montana. Hannah's from Wyoming. You know, we're we're outdoorsy people. Sorry, uh, I just had to throw in the Lebowski <laughs> line. I didn't mean for it to sound so aggressive. Oh, yeah. Man, I was like, damn. Adam hates the na- So we know that Adam hates the post office and the national park. Uh, is what we've learned for the OG Clips and Dip listeners um, who might remember. Um, so we got this game versus the Blazers on Saturday at a hearty 1 p.m. This is the lesser of the two games. I think we can both agree that, right? Definitely. Per- Personnel-wise. Portland is one of the most tanking teams that we have seen in years right now, shutting down Damian Lillard like that. They is. Is Keon Johnson still there? I haven't kept up with that. <laughs> Check. I don't think so. <laughs> because he may have revenge on his mind, and that should be something they worry about. But oh, he is. he is. Uh oh. Is he? Has he been injured? Let me look. Or just in the G League? Or just not good. Um, looking at his last game logs, he's getting some inactive. So I don't. <laughs> He's gotten four okay. in a row. So I don't we'll really see. Care. Just something to look for. You know, the Clippers traded him. You Going up against your former employer. I'm not saying it's Russell Westbrook going up against the Lakers <laughs> or anything like that. But <laughs> for trying to find storylines in an otherwise pretty meaningless game for the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah, and I think the big question for this one for Clippers fans is what is the Kawhi situation, right? Like, he technically played in the back-to-back recently albeit after sit- surprisingly sitting out the second half of one of the games. Yeah. Um, Ohm asked Ty at practice today just what the situation was, and Ty said it's going to be a wait and see on whether Ka- Kawhi will play both games of this weekend's back-to-back. Um, so I guess I mean, we'll see. Couldn't he end up just having to play the first six minutes of the game against the Portland Trail Blazers? If the Clippers are playing well and locked in and not overlooking them and not having a letdown after a big emotional game against the Lakers, they should be fine regardless of who is out there with the depth on this team. I totally agree. And I might be down with Kawhi playing another first half and then sitting out. <laughs> like if If we have this one and he wants to keep his rhythm, great, but... Yeah, I don't – I think – I mean, you would rather have him play against the Suns, right, if we had to pick one of these? I guess just to have him more on standby against the Suns in case they need it or want it. Rather have him more fully loaded for that game and yeah. have him play limited minutes against the Portland Trail Blazers because they should be able to run away with it <laughs> anyways. And I know that's – that's a dangerous game, I guess, with this Clippers team this season. You don't never know what you're going to get. I'm hoping now they're a little bit more laser focused with just how close things are in the standings and how close the playoffs are and how good they looked against the Lakers the other night. I'm hoping they're just a little bit more, you know, reliable uh, from a fan base perspective of knowing what you're going to get with this team. Yes. yes, that would be nice at game 81 of the season <laughs> to get. Um so what we need to do well in this one process, right? I want to see the process that the Clippers have been doing, which is get the ball out to shooters, touch the paint, swing it, turn down a good shot for a great shot. That's what I'm looking for in this Blazers game. If the Clippers have good process, I pretty much kind of think they win. If the process is bad, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, I want to see them play just as hard defensively as they did against the Lakers, even though they're taking on the Blazers now. 
And we mentioned Norman Powell earlier. Maybe the most encouraging thing to me was seeing him give a much better effort defensively in that game against the Lakers. I know he still yeah. picked up a couple of tough fouls, but he was competing out there. He was going for steals. He had a block. He almost had one more. It was called a foul. Uh, that was the Norman Powell I thought we would see throughout the majority of the season because he's a better defender than he has shown as good as he has been offensively with that. and he yeah. still had a really good year overall and yeah. could have been six man of the year if he didn't get hurt multiple times. But defensively there have been lapses there where I just expected him to give a better effort and compete more coming from what I saw in Toronto and at times with the Portland trailblazers. He's taken too many possessions off defensively when as you know, diminutive as he is, he still has long arms. He still was known as somebody that would fight through screens and make life difficult for whoever uh, his assignment was. And I just want to see more of that because if they're taking on the Phoenix Suns in the first round, they're going to need basically what you saw from Norman Powell against the Lakers. That's the Norman yeah. Powell they're going to have to have. And if they're going to win it all, assuming Paul George comes back and gives them that opportunity where it's back on the table to win the championship because you're fully loaded it, Norm kind of has to turn into who Reggie Jackson was during the 21 playoff run. Like he has to be the third option. And realistically with his talent level, he could be a better version of what Reggie Jackson was during that run, who was phenomenal, but Norm just has a higher skill set overall. He might have to be close to second option because I think he can outplay Russ. And if there's no Paul George, right, who's the second option? <laughs> you know? Right. No, I, I'm saying if Paul George was back, oh, got it. Sorry. Yeah, he yeah, needs yeah. to get into that Reggie uh, mode. And at times, obviously, when Kawhi went down, he was the second option. Reggie Jackson was during the 2021 yeah. playoff run. <laughs> But I just – Norman Powell, that was kind of the blueprint for what they need from him. I know a lot of people don't like the fact that he does some foul baiting out there. Honestly, I don't think it's a bad thing to have a guy like that. <laughs> I'm a little worried in the playoffs, though. I Like, regular season, I love it. Keep doing it. Zoo was joking about it uh, post game after the Lakers, how he needed to go to Norm's summer camp and <laughs> learn how to foul bait. But I think in the playoffs, I'm not sure those calls will get – as many whistles as we want him to. Um, and if he's not seeing his shot fall, I can see him maybe try and rely on those, which isn't necessarily good. But everything else you said, I think is right. I think what's funny is we've not wanted these three man, li these three guard lineups, right? But now we're getting kind of um, almost these three guard lineups with like Norm, Bones, Terrence, and stuff like that. So I, I kind of hope we're not trying anything new in this Blazers game, you know, like I'm yeah. not, I, is Marcus Morris going to play? I don't know. <laughs> like we got two more games to figure that out, but this Blazers team, I'm just looking up the Blazers versus Spurs. Um, <laughs> like recap notes. Who won just, that game last night? I didn't even see. Uh, the Spurs won by two. And you just don't know who any of these people are. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. But you, it's they're like 450 of the best, or they're part of the 450 best players in the world, regardless. But like, here was the starting five for the Blazers uh, John Butler, Jonathan Williams, Drew Eubanks, Skylar Mays, and Trendon Watford. Mm. Their, their bench is Justin Manaya, Jabari Walker, Shaquille Harrison, and Kevin Knox. Like, this is a game, like, this is a game to work on shit that we know works, if that makes sense. No new wrinkles. In the second to last game before the regular season is over, let's drill down what they've been doing in practice. Let's work on these kind of new bringing Batum in to kind of help the defense. Um, yeah. When we kind of have the bench guards in there, like we don't need to do anything wacky <laughs> against this Blazers team. They need to refine and sharpen their strengths, the stuff they're already good at, and just get at that mode where, okay, we know it's been a long season. We haven't exactly established an identity. But here are the things we can do very well. And we just did it the other night against the Los Angeles Lakers. Yeah. And that looked like a team playing with purpose that knew who they were out there. Definitely, yeah. They can still – it's dangerous. You don't want to be a flip-the-switch team ever. But they still have these moments that make you think, wow, they should have been like this all season – 
Why did they get up for a game against the Lakers and not other teams? Like it's all still there. The ingredients you want to see that make you a championship contender for the Clippers. They just have to exhibit it more consistently. And obviously with just two games left in the playoffs right around the corner, it better start now. So yeah, against the Blazers, good process, <laughs> not yes. experimenting too much. <laughs> like, look, if you're up 20, if they're running away with it in the first half, then maybe you do a little bit of sure. that because Let's you're naturally <laughs> going to see lineups of guys playing just to rest guys who may play against the Phoenix Suns the next day. That, that That's going to happen with rotations, I think. You might see Amir Coffey. I wouldn't be shocked if he's playing out there tomorrow. And good for Amir because he hasn't got a lot of run this season. Yeah, it'll be, it will be good for Amir. We can give him – some some Sundarius minutes basically, um, which uh, you know everyone needs those, I guess, for that for that confidence. Um, okay, so we both agree that we think that the Clippers should be able to handedly kind of take out this this Blazers team. Let's move on to the other brunch game we have, which is the next day in Phoenix on Easter Sunday at twelve thirty. I can't imagine this is going to be a very well attended game. If I had to guess, <laughs> um, I don't know. The, there may be just so much buzz because they have Kevin Durant that it doesn't matter that they believe they are the favorites to come out of the West. Now that the Phoenix fans may show up, they might show up. And it's like, it's their final home game, right? Like this is fan appreciation day. Fan appre <laughs> yeah. I don't know what they're going to give them. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, this one, I, I are you with Law Murray that they're going to run out their full strength team? The Clippers? The, or the, the Phoenix Suns? Suns. Uh, because they're not playing tonight, we assume against the Lakers. I could see that for a quarter or for a half. I could just to tune okay. things up, tighten things up. Because they already know they're going to have five days off before game one of the first round. And they just don't have the reps with Kevin Durant out there. And that's, you know, you win a game against the Nuggets by just four at home who didn't play anyone. <laughs> Any, nobody, yeah. That's a little bit of a red flag. That's a little bit alarming. That tells you you still need to work out the kinks. And they just haven't looked like a well-oiled machine at all. Understandably, you just brought him yeah, in. He missed a sure. bunch of games. He's back now. Uh, and... Devin Booker likes to isolate a ton too. So, yeah. you know, it's not always – and it's never going to look like the Golden State Warriors with Kevin Durant who already oh, had boy. this amazing system in place where everyone was sharing the ball and making guys next to them better. Yeah, and no one had caught up yet. In Kevin Durant, yeah. And exposing teams with all their three-point shooting – it's it's a different situation with the Phoenix Suns. I do think at their best, can they touch some of those levels where they just look unbeatable at their best? Yes. But I don't think they're going to be in that gear nearly as often as the Golden State Warriors were with Kevin Durant. I, I agree with that. Um, one thing we got to talk about is, does Marcus Morris come back? Because if he doesn't come back for either of these games, I don't see him getting run in the playoffs. Because you're not ramping them back up from COVID and now back spasms to like getting into, I mean, or maybe Ty does, but I think if, if Kawhi doesn't play against the Blazers, which would be a little annoying, but I think we could both see it, but he plays against the Suns. I think that's Marcus's best chance to come back. Ty's talked about familiarity all year with why Marcus was in the starting lineup before they made the change. I don't see why you, you know, would bring Marcus Morris back when Kawhi isn't back if you're Ty Lue. And if he's part of the nine-man rotation in the playoffs, Who's then kind? Bones is out. Robert Covington Plumley is who definitely is out, isn't think. playing. Oh I yeah, Roko's already out. I think Plumley. I think maybe it would be Plumley switched out for something. Depending on the matchup, yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah, so. Maybe him Plumlee, and Plumley. Or... He could get the treatment that. Dwight Howard got for the Lakers in the bubble against the Houston Rockets, where okay. I think he just didn't play in that series, or he and JaVale McGee didn't play a ton. One yeah. of them really had to sacrifice. I think it was Dwight. That could be the situation with Mason Plumley. But I, I was thinking about this earlier today. Why does there have to be this cemented, 
Well, it's just how the NBA does it in the playoffs. You go with an eight-man or a nine-man rotation. Why does it have to be so rigid like that? I, I, I get the stakes are so high, and you would rather know who your guys are going to be in those situations, but couldn't it also be good to be malleable out there? And if you have a coach like, like Coach Lou who likes to try things and has beaten teams by going small – and throwing wrinkles in there at the last minute and making those tough decisions that you just make guys available that you don't have to, you know, reveal who your nine man or eight man rotation is like, just leave it open and have 10 guys ready. <laughs> I mean, the, the way this Clippers season has been, which I think you could kind of nail it down to one phrase, which is by the seat of their pants. That's what we're going into the playoffs with, right? Like we're talking about, what the rotation is going to be for game 82 <laughs> against the Suns. And if, like this is, and this is, I think where Tyloo thrives, hopefully in this kind of like throwing stuff at the wall, see what sticks. We're riding it till it's hot. Again, he's Ty's been really good with the rotations lately um, in ways that I think should calm down a lot of Clippers fans, myself included with what the playoffs are going to look like. And if they're taking on the Phoenix Suns, you mentioned it earlier, the biggest advantage they have is their depth and their bench. Their bench could obliterate Phoenix. And if they yes. win those minutes by a lopsided number, that could be the difference in the series. If the starters are just competitive against Phoenix and their starters with KD, and the bench wins their minutes by a significant margin, that's where the series could be won. That's where it would probably have to be won without Paul George. So assuming he's out. Which I think, yeah. Um, we don't know. We, we don't know. I, your optimism on this is unmatched, I would say. Um, <laughs> what I'm looking for in this Suns game, I, I can't remember who put these these stats on Twitter, but Bones obviously is on a hot streak right now. I think a lot of people are excited for what he's going to bring in the playoffs and next year for the Clippers. It's going to be fun to see kind of what happens with his development. But Bones is a badass. <laughs> Scoring all 14 of his points in the fourth quarter against the and Lakers. Some of his passes to Zoo, it was like, like the scoring I love seeing, but some of these passes, you're like, damn, you really might be a point guard. Like we've heard some guys talk about that before, but Bones, like, he can he can sling it. And the fact that Kawhi was looking for him when he was being doubled, and they ran a play for Bones for three out of a timeout. If Kawhi and Coach Lou trust him that much in that big of a game, how can Bones Highland, as long as he's given effort defensively and not turning the basketball over, not get minutes in the playoffs? You talked about Eric Gordon is going to win the Clippers a playoff game. I think you tweeted that out. Bones Highland can win the Clippers a playoff game. I think if they're going to get through the first round against Phoenix – there's going to have to be a Bones Highland like Someone's got to pop up. Like, there's got to be, I think there has to be all of it, right? There's got to be a Bones game. There's got to be a Norm game. There's got to be an EJ game. Yeah. The like, others have to crazy. swing the series for the Clippers if they're not going to have Paul George throughout it. Yeah. Man. But yeah. So Kawhi and Bones plus 33 and 70 minutes together overall. And since PG went down, they're plus 30 in 57 minutes. If you're playing well with Kawhi Leonard on the floor, you have a spot on this Clippers playoff rotation for sure. So we got to hope that that hot streak um, and, keeps up. And uh, Russ and Kawhi haven't meshed that great. Russ and Kawhi no. haven't. Look at the numbers. They, the Clippers offense is better when Russ is off the floor on a points per possession situation. Joseph Ryan Ward <laughs> tweeted a lot about it, um, but we're still working on that. What are we looking for defensively against this Suns team for this last game? Because we're going to learn a lot about how we're going to match up with them potentially four or five days later. I mean, if it is game zero of this seven-game series, I would hope they don't reveal much at all. And Coach Lou pulls what he did against the Lakers saying, oh, yeah, we're going to single cover uh, Anthony Davis with Ibiza Zubots. And then immediately so they were throwing doubles left and right. And AD never got comfortable. Uh, that was a stroke of genius. Whether or not the Lakers actually believed it, it worked. And guys were so sound with their coverage and getting back and rotating. They looked so good and they sustained that level of defense more so throughout than what we had seen recently from this team. Like 
in that first game against the OKC Thunder where the first five minutes the Clippers looked unbelievable with how locked in they were defensively. But then it would just go by the wayside. They right. end up losing. We've seen that so many times. But finally, and maybe the move having Avisa Zuba starting the second quarter. I and totally think it does. Early in the first, <laughs> you know, that could have been the biggest difference because they've been getting killed in second quarter minutes. It just makes sense to stagger him more. But defensively, I just love seeing that much of an effort cons- consistently throughout a ball game. And I, I don't know if they're going to show much against Phoenix if they think that's – and it could be said that that's the opponent going yeah, into Yeah, if they that. have nothing to play for if, – if there's, quote-unquote, not anything to play for standings-wise, this could also be a very gross game <laughs> from the Clippers, right? Where's that to you? A way back-to-back. If it doesn't matter, be prepared for some sloppy basketball. I think from both sides, but who, who knows what's going to happen with that. Um, how are you feeling heading into this back-to-back? They're, they're still uncertain. We don't know what seed we're going to be. Where's at? What's the the Updike fun check for Adam Oslin <laughs> right now? I feel pretty good about it. That Lakers game, you know, I had a lot of trepidation going into it because it's hard to just continually beat a team over and over again, especially a team with LeBron James. But they have continually had success against LeBron. In the 2-1-3 era, he's played his worst basketball overall against the Clippers. He's had a numerous amount of games where he shot under 40% against them. And at the half, he had more turnovers than points. <laughs> he looked he looked so tired in that first half. It was bad, yeah. He looked gassed, but the Clippers really loaded up against him and Anthony Davis the right way where – they still were able to get back to their spots, and for the most part, I know Tro- Troy Brown hit a few three-pointers. Their defense was was good. Like Guys were connected. Terrence Mann, I love what he did against LeBron James for the most part. Yeah. When Kawhi was on him, shouldn't have got called for that foul on the block he had in the first half. Uh, Horrible refing to end that game as well, too, but. Freaking Avita Zubat's getting tackled by Wenyan Gabriel underneath the basket was one of the most shocking non calls I've seen in a long that time. That was nuts. Yeah. Like, but if Zubas got hurt on that play, <laughs> the outrage and the amount of replays we would have saw for a non call that was just an obvious foul <laughs> would be insane. And it was yes. it was a violent play. <laughs> Uh, a violent act. <laughs> but my overall point is that win against the Lakers showed something. Because I don't like the fact that they only seem to play at 110% against the Lakers and a few other times so far this season. But it's all still there with the Clippers. The ability, the talent level, uh, the grittiness, the big shot making when you need it. I thought what Bones Highland did in that fourth quarter, he's unafraid. He has no fear. He wants those moments. That stuff can translate into the playoffs. Like As much as the people talk about the Sacramento Kings and not having much experience with that roster and how De'Aaron Fox has never been in the playoffs, well, I bet you De'Aaron Fox still has a really good series, regardless if they win or not. <laughs> right. Just based off the fact that all season long, he's been the most clutch player in the NBA, most points in the last five minutes of games within five points. Some of that stuff can still translate. You can still see what a guy is made of sometimes in the regular season. It doesn't always work out this way. Sometimes they fall apart in a playoff series. I don't think the Aaron Fox is. I don't think a guy like Bones Highland, who does have some playoff experience, is all of a sudden going to shy away or start clanking a bunch of shots from the outside when he pulls up off the dribble from three. I think he has something. Like he has something to him that, you know, allows him to rise and meet the moment. The Bones coming out party. The playoff T-Bones is going to be incredible. We might have to do a podcast uh, after T-Bones has a good game where we're all three just eating a steak during the recording. I think I think steaks for the T-Bones game actually might be something we need to do. Where are um, your vibes at right now going into the weekend? I'm like, I have so much nervous energy, <laughs> like, honestly. Like, I'm so nervous for the game, for the Pels game tonight. Um I just really want them to lose, you know. I just really want the Bills to lose. But I'm – the only things I really have trepidation about are, is Morris going to play at all? And are we going to get enough meaningful run against the Blazers? I think the Suns game, 
I hope I don't have to. I hope it doesn't matter. Obviously, I hope the Suns game is both teams are like, hey, we're playing each other. The seating is already set. Let's just go. Ha- let's have a fun Easter game or whatever we're doing out here. <laughs> but I'm feeling that Kawhi is playing on a level that is unmatched right now. I think in the NBA, Terrence is starting to kind of hit his little stride. Bones is hitting a stride. Batum, not the best shooting out against the Lakers, but still a lot of good stuff. Uh, plus thirteen from him. Yeah, I thought plus, his his 13. rotations were elite. Yep, Ty seems to be hitting his rotation stride. So like. EJ's coming back. I, I think he was held out from practice, but no one's worried about it. Zoo's just Zeus had more double doubles this year than ever. And it's like I'm feeling really good at 1 20 p.m. on Friday, April 7th. <laughs> we'll see how I'm feeling, I, how we look after the game on Saturday. But I'm I'm feeling pretty good. The nervousness is totally understandable from Clipper Nation because in a season of so many unknowns with what you're gonna get from this team every night. Now there's other outside variables that they really can't affect, like a game tonight with the Pelicans and New York Knicks. That could mean so much. You have (laughs) no effect on it whatsoever, and you just have to watch and hope. And it could come down to finding out who your playoff opponent is the final game of the season. Also another big unknown hanging over this team and fan base's head. So it's just – there's never been a secure moment so far this season, you know? <laughs> seat of our pants. That's what I've been saying. It's been a seat of our pants season. Um, that about wraps up for today's episode. We are going to, I mean, Adam's going to be working all damn weekend. He's going to have you pre and post game over on AM 570. And I think we're doing, I'm ready to go for double dips all weekend. If you're down to do on Saturday and Sunday. I was also thinking on Sunday, maybe we just do a tripod later that night because we're going to know the matchup by then. I don't know. Maybe we get it. We get one out early. We I'm beat the it. Clippers podcast traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll definitely do a try. We'll do double dips. We got a tripod either on Sunday night or on Monday. Who knows? We're going to try. We're going to have preview pods for every playoff game. Obviously double dips, some post game playoffs. It's the first clips and dips playoffs. So everyone should be very excited. Uh, and for, we for are fully time. operational with our YouTube channel too. Yes, we are fully operational. We have our background posters. Adam might need to put up another one. I don't know how he feels about interior design, but we'll <laughs> see. Um, yeah, if you could, and you're listening or you're watching, you like us, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe. Uh, give us a review on iTunes. It's very important. We'll read the best ones. Um, I haven't checked today, so if I missed it, I apologize. But yeah, Adam, anything else you want to say to these fine Clippers folks before we send them out for the final regular season weekend for the Clips? Last time I ended the show saying, all right, Utah, get up for this game in Salt Lake City. Let's go. (laughs) And you know what? They pushed the Lakers. They did damage on them, (laughs) making them have to earn it and taking that game into overtime, even though they were down many men. And I think the Lakers, uh, understandably, were probably overlooking them and looking past them to the Clippers game to an extent. So how about the New York Knickerbockers get up for this one tonight? How about Let's they go. figure out a way? Is is Derrick Rose <laughs> going to get s- some minutes out there? Is Tibbs still going to run out You know his starters for 40 minutes tonight in a meaningless AB. game? If there's anybody that would do it, <laughs> you would think it would be him. <laughs> so that game tonight against the Pelicans is pivotal. If that – if that goes the Knicks' direction, chaos will ensue. <laughs> Let's go. We're cheering for chaos. We're cheering for Clippers wins. We'll be back with y'all uh, all weekend as well as a tripod. Hope everyone has a great rest of your Friday and a wonderful, stress-free uh, Clippers away home back-to-back to finish the season. Let's go Clips. <laughs>